Shalom, my friends. Shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi. I feel like I'm looking in a mirror almost. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us in the neighborhood. I am delighted and excited to talk to someone who knows how to move. For 25 years, Daniel Gortzman has danced first with Garth Fagan and Mark Morris, and then with his own company. Then why are you putting this on my head? Why? Why? To, well, to distinguish between two, no, two bald guys. Disco what? balls. They're disco, disco balls. Oh, the disco balls. I get this. I, I had disco balls, and they itched for a week. Anyway, we are, we're talking with Daniel Gortz when he found an artichoke dance. And then, God damn it, we did it. I mean, <laughs> so dance company, which is called Daniel Gortzman Dance Company. He could have thought of something a little more original than that, I know. But he's also an assistant professor up in Ithaca College, and his company furthers the idea that dance should be open to everyone. And everyone, you're going to want to go see. If you're in Ithaca, go see his show, E-Motion. It's running from now until June 4th at the Cherry Art Space. I've got jokes I can make about that, believe me. Or if you can't get there, it's all right. They're, li they're live streaming this thing. You can pay $20 and watch it at the cherry.org forward slash E slash i will tell you. Anyway, won't you welcome and shalom to the neighborhood, Daniel Gwertzman. Shalom to you. Good Shabbos, Rabbi. It's wonderful to be here. Good Shabbos to you. It's Don't actually my second time in shul in the last couple of weeks, We're, if we count we today. I, well, why were you in shul the last time? Was it was it, uh, was it Shavuos? Why? Well, it was a really happy occasion. It was um, one of my oldest friend's son's bar mitzvah, and uh, I was called to the bima to lift the Torah. So that was really exciting as well. Now, do you go to shul specifically on Simchas Torah so you can dance around with a Torah? Well, I have wonderful memories of a Simchat Torah in Washington Heights. With um, I live in a very Jewish neighborhood up in, in right i mean new york in general but in, in washington heights and definitely um they love to celebrate and they don't hold back <laughs> so it was yeah now i have to ask this is a very beautiful place is that your where you live or are you in a library somewhere i love just that, what a perfect little place you are where is that so are this you... study this is my virtual study and i've been um known for having some wonderful backgrounds to enjoy this zoom experience and yeah, so it's also part of the whole virtual aspect of this show that I've been involved in and really working with technology to create these yeah. ulterior scenarios and settings. So what was that like for you? I mean, having been a dance teacher and a choreographer, a dancer for all those years, and then suddenly, boom, March 2020, did you feel like the bottom fell out until you discovered, oh, we can do some things on the end? I mean, what was that like for you? Running sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, happily, we were able to pivot very easily because the companies had a history of producing dance films for over the last decade. So we were in the studio up until just a couple of days before, you know, that bomb dropped. And we had an engagement at Bryant Park in the city that was supposed to happen called Fantasyland. And so we turned that lemon into lemonade and made the Fantasyland project, which was a for the screen, a for the film medium project with 16 dancers in 16 different locations. Nobody in their living room. I thought we don't need to see anybody else in their living room and see all, you know, so everybody went out to an exterior location and it was all done remotely and was an exciting project. So I appreciate the question so much, certainly because many were so deeply affected we were one of the first companies to come back together and work in August of 2020. We had a residency with a dozen dancers. We were working upstate, safely distanced, creating film work outside, wearing masks, getting tested, and we had no, no hitch. It really worked beautifully, and we were able, again, to just capitalize on some of this film work that we've been able to work on. I, just, I, mean, I do wonder, like you know, even back in the early day when you're trying to do Zoom and things, you've got 16 dancers or whatever, all in their little window. How, but how does the choreography work where there's no delay? Is there just some sort of program you put into the computer that syncs the music so they're all hearing and dancing to it at the same second? So the rehearsal process was all done individually, where I would Zoom with one of the 16, 15 dancers. I was in that project as well as a performer. And we storyboarded first, it started with finding a location and these dancers were, were all over the, the Northeast and not everybody was in New York at that moment. And 
So they were responsible for finding a place that could feed a fantasy, that could feed this metaphoric scenario. And then I would, they would send pictures and videos and then we would meet and we would have a choreographic collaborative process. They would go back to what was also unique about this project was each of the performers were responsible. Each one was responsible for having that filmed as well, which means finding somebody that could do it, which wasn't the easiest thing during the pandemic or setting it up with a tripod themselves if they had being creative. And then I would um, you know, see that footage and sometimes there were second takes or third takes. So after all that was done, it was edited together with the music as a film. It wasn't that it was a, a live experience. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I yeah. Right. So that so that, you know, it was easy to become tired of the Zoom squares or rectangles and, you know, trying to elevate that and bring something immediate to folks. Now tell us about emotion, which yeah. is I mean, it's it's gonna be live on stage and you're just filming yeah. it in the watch, but what is the, the idea of emotion? Sure, and also that it's live for those watching too, with without compromise. In your introduction, you mentioned that, but it's been designed for the TV screen. So oh. there are multiple cameras and it's being edited in real time. So there's a live stream team that like, you know, at a sporting event is calling which camera next, this angle, push in, zoom out, overhead, blah, blah. So it's very immediate, up close and personal without compromise. Um, Emotion is a collaboration with a playwright, Saviana Stanescu. She's a Romanian born playwright of note. And we've both independently been musing on technology and the concerns and certainly now with the exponential boom of chat GPT and all of all of that's in the news every moment, um, it exacerbated this long standing concern and curiosity. It's a narrative, there's a script which is new for the company in our 25 years of performing, where there is a through line with consistent characters. And that is being heard through voiceover that was recorded by actors. And we are dancing in this dance theater hybrid that is between a neuroscientist and her artificially intelligent creature named H, which I portray. Oh my! Oh, so you're right. I didn't even realize you were in it. You're you're H, the the thing. <laughs> I'm H, H the AI. Personality or is it or or because chat the whole thing of chat GPT and AI is now they're having wit and personality and humor and pathos. Yeah. So are you just uh, or? It's funny that you say they're having it, right? They're having it because we, the humans, are designing it so that they will have it. But, you know, as, um, we are definitely anthropomorphizing H in this, you know, because it's set a bit now and into the future where um, the biggest fear and concern and also desire is for sentience to come to AI to have, you know, a sense of consciousness. Again, I, I say that it's a fear and a desire because, um, the capitalistic race to be the first is, of course, propelling this and couching these machines to be companions, to be, you know, service instructors, to be babysitters, you know, what, whatever it is. Ex-partners, just saying, just saying. <laughs> well, right. I mean, we read these crazy stories, Rabbi, of people that are, you know, choosing to shack up with a, a robot. I mean, like tuning out the world and tuning into to this, uh, you know, animated pet of sorts that can just give them the affirmation that they want and and be it so but you know that that's more the exception of course and there's something that we could find just humorously curious about but the larger grave concerns are such that um we don't know you know how this could cause grave um systemic disruption to life as we know it or worse. And so the piece is not shying away from these ethical questions. This is a dance work. It is a very dense dance work. I'm thrilled. I just finished a fourth performance last night with another one tonight and final show tomorrow. It's an extended duet with a beautiful dancer, Sarah Hillman, who's a member of Daniel Gortzman Dance Company. And the music is um, a commemoration. Wait, everyone is part of the dance company or they all whoever's in the show are they all Daniel Gortzman dance unless you have a guest yeah. Yeah. yes yes and this piece is a duet so it's a bit character different of um you know some of our other repertory works which involve many dancers yeah I just wanted to mention that the music which is from a dear collaborator named Jeff Story who lived in Philadelphia and also worked for the Philadelphia Dance Company for years and years i.e decades 
and was the longstanding 20 plus year collaborator passed unexpectedly last April and using all of his music from his archives, some that never been heard before, some that are uh, extracted from previous works that we collaborated on. Well, that's the sound score for the, the whole piece. And it's a real range. Uh, the Ithaca Times reviewed it as ranging from propulsive to electronic and, and mentioned WC and Philip Glass in the review of his work, which is just so heartening that his art can live on, which of course is is a hope as an artist, you know, or 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 I should say somebody in any discipline that one's one's work has that chance to breathe and live. Now, now let me ask you one other thing. I always loved the name, the early name, the, when you had the first company called Artichoke. I'm not, first of all, why did you name the dance company Artichoke? And then why no longer Artichoke? Why has it been Daniel Gortzman dance for 20 years? Thank you for bringing that up. Artichoke continues and is alive and well, and at this point must have a, a beautiful harvest in uh, store for the summer months into the fall. Artichoke Dance Company was started in 1995 by myself and two colleagues of mine from the University of Michigan, Amy Drum and Lynn Newman. And we formed it as a repertory company with Artichoke as its name precisely for its metaphoric value. It's something that had a lot of different textures and layers, but was held together by a sweet heart which was the heart of our friendship. We graduated together. We were young artists. We were new on the scene in New York. And we developed a company which was not common at that time. So the whole ecosystem of dance funding was shifting. The NEA was no longer providing the same kind of support that we had in the 70s into the 80s. And companies were disbanding. And yes, I had danced with Garth and Mark Morris, as you mentioned, and then um, I was also interested in continuing to um, to choreograph alongside of performing. And at that time, when we formed the company, it just was not common to have a new company or independent choreographers even producing work the way that it's it's ubiquitous and has been for a long time now. So that very first concert was reviewed in both the New York Times and the Village Voice. Um, under the headline and the voice, the next generation young companies with strange names. And we were a repertory company. I was making work, the other artistic directors were making work that were very different. My work tending to be more pure dance and abstract, Amy Drum's work more comedic, Lynn Newman's more acrobatic. And so they were very different textures, but again, there was that friendship that held it together. I left Artichoke in 1998-99 to form Daniel Gortzman Dance Company, um, maintained a wonderful relationship. We were brought back for 20th anniversary season and reprised a collaborative, some of the collaborative work we did. Um, and that was a real excitement. Artichoke has a commitment to the environment and has long done a lot, both with social justice and um, environmentally friendly and important advocacy work. So, you know, I'm proud that that company continues to flourish with a, a lot of work being done currently. With Mazel. So, Thank the work you. you do with Daniel Gortzman, is it still, because what you're working on e-commerce, uh, I'm sorry, emotion, does not sound particularly abstract if you've got a script. Yeah. Is most of your other work with your company abstract-ish or have you broadened or, you know, what, what do you think of a dance? What are you thinking of these days? Well, I so love that because abstract in a way that's highly accessible and allows a viewer way in. The mission of this company from the beginning is that everyone can dance. And that doesn't mean everyone has to physically be a dancer. It means that everybody can understand and appreciate dance and be educated about it to feel comfortable with your opinion. So a lot of times in concert dance, somebody's not sure what they're seeing, oh, I'm missing it, or I'm not equipped to speak about it, you know, could be a common refrain. I like to turn that on its end and put the onus on the choreographer. You know, in the medium of dance, if something is not being clear, then let's put the burden on the maker, not on the viewer, and that you can trust your opinion. It's okay to let your mind wander. It's okay to not like something. It's okay to be bored, but hopefully you are engaged and there's something. You know, Rabbi, I think about when we go to the symphony and we're, we're in a concert hall listening to music, we're not, we're not thinking, oh my gosh, why that chord right now? Why that? I mean, we might be, and certainly if we've studied music, we have a different way into that but we let it wash over us. Or when we're at the art museum, we don't spend time in front of every single work of art. Some galleries we just breeze through 
And then all of a sudden we might stand somewhere for 15 minutes. So it's the same in dance, but it's not considered good behavior to get up and leave the theater. Although, you know, folks historically have done that. Um, oh, wait, let me stop you right there. Cause that gets sure. one of the questions in, in all your years, so many years as a choreographer and also as a performer, what are some of the worst or funniest things, you know, cause things happen uh, that you've witnessed either in the audience or on stage, you know, what, what nightmare moments or hilarious moments have occurred? Oh gosh. Well, I'll have to pause and think about something that really stands out. I mean, even just a program falling onto a stage last night, for example. Um, but you know, I sort of peripherally see it and then I next I know that it's not there. Somebody reached for it and grabbed it. Um, you know, in terms of nightmarish, um, I mean that's a, a pretty strong <laughs> Well, I mean they, question. They, yeah, but you know, like what, what I remember about I yeah. I, I would say something that, that stands out because it's summer perhaps is the company had a performance in Beacon, New York, which is outside of the city. And we were at a wonderful wooded area with an outdoor performance inside a beautiful barn theater. And this was a this is a piece that you actually <laughs> referenced in some of your promotional materials, a piece called Puzzle. And uh a classic work of the companies for three dancers that are, as Jack Anderson wrote in the New York Times at the time, you know, creating a puzzle through our bodies, something like that he wrote. So we're very entwined. And as we were in these sculptural forms on the ground, we could see steam literally rising from our bodies. It was so cool. No, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Well, it, was it was hot, but it was cool and uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Well. I mean, you know, he doesn't really phase um dancers i don't think but it was just that there was something kind of mystical and out of the ordinary about it um oh gosh i mean there have been every performance has a memory um and you know i i'd have to think more without talking to really reflect on like the highs and lows of that nothing immediately comes to mind but just to finish that point you know to empower audiences so abstraction and dance with a script and emotion allows an audience to see how meaning can come to the words, how we can take words and and translate them into movement and through repetition and through the story, it's a really inviting way, wholly accessible. So while I did mention abstract at the time of Artichoke, uh, since Daniel Gwertzman Dance Company has been formed, there's been a real interest to take care of our audiences, you know, and to really understand that, you know, there's an opportunity and it's okay to, to not like something, but first to just trust your opinion, you're having one anyway. And to allow associations to happen when we listen to music and we look at visual art, we think about other things. We want to think about other things. The same is, is totally kosher in dance as well. Oh, I love that word, kosher and dance. I think it's kosher and dance. By the way, I want to uh, remind people, first of all, that it's e-motion and it is happening, first of all, live and in person at the Cherry Arts Theater or Art Space at 102 Cherry Street in Ithaca. If you can't get there, you know, you're watching from New York City or Colorado or Israel, hopefully Israel. Remember, yes, hopefully my cousins are tuning in from Jerusalem. See, see, isn't that wonderful? They can pay 20 <laughs> bucks American and go to the cherry.org, the cherry.org. It's Look right up. there on the main page. Yeah. And, and, and watch it and watch it with, uh, live, which is a wonderful. Let me ask you, though, do you remember, you probably do, the first time that you went to see, and, and it made an impression on you, a dance performance, as opposed to going to a Broadway show and seeing, you know, we can talk about that too. But what was the first dance performance that you went to see? So my parents wanted me to see the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater perform at Art Park, which is in Lewiston, New York. And they had seen revelations. And my mom talked about Judith Jamison, as, as most people did, who were struck by the towering presence that she was in the Ailey Company. And I was so moved by the performance. I was 12 years old, I think. And I became ill that night coming back in the car, just, just emotionally. I mean, I was, it was just, my mother loves to tell the story. Um, I think I was just so worked up emotionally from the extreme um, excitement of this performance, which of course is a masterwork. So Alvin Ailey's Revelations is one of the seminal dances period of this or any time and has been seen arguably by more people, you know, than any other dance. So being able to see this, which 
captures the African American experience and was um, a really seminal work from the time it it premiered, um, 1960. So, yeah, that that was that's a very memorable performance. And I had just started studying modern dance at that time, but I had been dancing since birth, and I had been dancing folk dance, specifically Israeli folk dancing, through my temple thanks to a wonderful mentor who's written into the history books, Molly Schaefer Rutzen. Um, you could check her out in the Encyclopedia of Great American Jewish Women. And she was teaching and it was required for everybody in Hebrew school at that time. But then once I you know, had the bar mitzvah and elected to continue to go to Hebrew high school, and I was with this troupe from kindergarten through my senior year of high school, we performed, we performed at town hall in New York and would travel to other cities upstate and host festivals. And so that love of dance was fueled and informed by folk dance from an early age, which informs now and has for decades the pedagogy um, and yeah. the practice of my work. I mean, the, the producer of this program, Dave, he, he remembers he was in Jewish elementary school and you had, it was, dance was a required thing. But all that it was basically just go around in a cycle, hold on, go in a cycle, go like this, go like this, make believe you're, you're ironing things because we're doing something about the ILGWU. It was just like, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't dance as we think of it. It was, as you said, folk dance. So it's, yeah. it's, you kind of moved away from that a little bit, at least. Well, I, I would say not at all. I would argue the opposite with respect. It's a continuum. Movement is movement. You can call it what you want. But at the end of the day, there's only a few choices as a human. Um, if you're able bodied and able to stand, then you could stand on two legs on one leg or on no legs. You could be in the air or if you're seated. Um, you know, in a chair, in a wheelchair, um, you know, there's there's various, but it's all movement. And there's really only, you know, limited possibilities. As a choreographer, you're, you're exploring the infinite possibilities within those parameters. Um, folk dance is pedestrian steps that anybody can do. And that's very characteristic of my work, which has a real pedestrian um, foundation. And it's complexity comes through manipulating speed and rhythmic complexity and changes of direction and quick shifts of weight but all of that shifting of weight and groundedness which is really central to modern dance that earthiness that um, opposition to um, being airborne like ballet and that verticality and elevation modern dance is the opposite it's rooted into the earth and the ground um, and of course it's shared with many other forms all over the world uh, so, you know, I would say that I haven't moved away from it. My my teaching, um, which is pre-professional through professional and the general community, creating multi-generational interactive community events where everybody can can join. And I teach these folk dances and social dances. And, um, you know, they they really are um, available to us. We walk mostly if we're if we're uh, fortunate to be able to walk, we, you know, are taking steps. And then if you just make it faster, it becomes a run. And if you change directions, you might say, you know, now it's dance, but I, I see that all as a continuum. So is that more Ma Morris or Fagan or you? I mean, what, who was it? It's Mark. So, well, that it's, again, it comes from my folk dancing. Now, Mark Morris had a folk dance background and he was folk dancing internationally from the time he was young and, and that informed his work. And so that communal human, humanistic element was certainly um, there in Mark's work, whereas Garth has had a, Garth similarly community, um, Garth started his company in 1970 as the bottom of the bucket, but dot 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 dance theater he had a vision um and he had a specific vision of the kind of dancer that would uh, interpret his work and rather than work with trained dancers he was incorporating untrained dancers and and formed this troupe that lost its bottom of the bucket but within its first decade they were already internationally on the map i'm bringing garth up because i think there's a shared humanistic sensibility it's certainly an african concept to dance uh for community and garth um coming from Jamaica and the Afro-Caribbean influences in that work and in the structuring of that company, you know, was also a very large influence for me as a dancer in that company, where you're dancing as part of a community and you're dancing from the inside out. And so that was shared. The difference is that Garth's work is highly stylized and a more specific stylization and technique. Mark Morris did not develop a technique. Mark Morris's 
Mark Morris dance groups, company classes, a ballet class typically taught by Mark, whereas Garth developed a technique, the Fagan technique. And so there was a different in terms of the realization. But I think from both um, a sense of um, what it is to dance with others, which again, harkens back to, to folk dancing, the circle you described, the great joy of dancing with somebody in a circle. Now, as an artistic director, choreographer and a teacher, as I do you find that it's been helpful that you've got these TV shows like So You Think You Can Dance and these Bowen Dance Competitions? Do you think that they've been helpful or do they instill some bad habits in students? Like when, when kids watch the voice things and they go, everybody's belting now and everybody's doing the melisma and all that crap. So uh -huh. <laughs> has it helped dancers? Certainly it's probably made more people interested in dance, quite honestly. But, you know, yeah. what, what, what has been the effect of all these TV shows? Okay. Yeah, the rising tide has lifted all boats. I absolutely believe that it has been a, a kind of new renaissance. Like if you think back to um, where dance was more part of popular culture, say in the 50s and the 60s, people doing the twist. I mean, listen, you could go back to the Charleston. To, dance has always been a part of popular culture. But where you had, you know, um, TV shows, American Bandstand or whatnot, where people were socially dancing, you know, you had... Um, now more people are tuning in and, and watching dance like even TikTok. so yes so you think you can dance dancing with the stars all of this elevates dance it it, it promotes it there's more exposure and with youtube and videos people are learning themselves you know they can watch it over and over and, and self um taught dances so i i think from the viewer experience i I don't see this high low art divide at all. I've been on record. Um, Dance USA asked me to write an essay about that in 2008 that was called Fan the Flames. That was just about this very question. In terms of for the dancer, I mean, um, habits will form certainly. I think um, it's a corollary to being in the room with a live instructor you know hopefully not an ai dance instructor yet but 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 working with somebody you know and taking dance classes but i i don't see really any negative side at all i think it's exciting that you know dance can be seen by more and then i think it also ups the ante so that where there may be more stock choreography or or um things that we've seen before as viewers become more informed they start to become more discriminating and start to value innovation more and and recognize you know oh i've seen this but this is new and, and i like seeing something new and so it also expands uh future dance makers and artists that way now speaking of the future i know you know, me i'm all gray in the beard a little bit of black you're you're still the black beard you got a little gray happening so the life of a dancer you know by, by 35 you're ancient so how did you see yourself how long Dan sings since you know you're starring in emotion there so how yeah. much more at some point do you step away I'm just a girl or you come on in roles that aren't so particularly demanding you know I thanks for this question because it's really personally meaningful as a dancer to be able to dance for over an hour in this production you know on stage the whole time and really um be quelling in the experience as a dancer like just to be so grateful to be able to be doing this a lot of wonderful role models and mentors. I mean, Merce Cunningham continued to dance into his 80s and he would insert himself himself into his pieces and do a solo, whether standing or on a, in a chair. And that excited audiences, you know, for sure. Martha Graham continued to dance well into her 60s. She and Rudolf Nureyev. Now, Graham and Nureyev didn't quite honor, we could say, the time when they should have stepped down. It was hard for them um, to accept aging as a dancer and to get away from that. So by the time Nureyev returned to Russia for the first time after defecting, the audiences that had been waiting for decades to see him do some of the ballet work was, you know, critically speaking, past some of the prime. And at the same time, the audiences were were by and large thrilled to get to see him. Um, so uh, that's more of a historic um, response to your question. Uh, just going back to Garth Fagan's company, Steve Humphrey, I'd love to shout out, has been a member of the company since 1970 and still performs with the company. And yes, um, he joined as a, as a kid. <laughs> no, he joined as a young adult. And so dancing into 60s and 70s is, is commonplace now. And I mean, it's not that every dancer will, but you have to be lucky enough to not sustain an injury that could shorten 
a career and I have colleagues for whom that has affected. So, you know, that's why I say, I don't take that for granted. It's a great joy to wake up in the morning, get out of bed, swing my legs off the side of the bed and be able to then go to the studio and dance. I dance with um, the memory of my father who passed two years ago and other dear family and friends whose whose life um, just gives me courage to an encouragement to just continue to push myself and challenge myself as a dancer. Well, we are pushed and challenged by the, the wonderful Daniel Gortzman. I got one more question for you, but at first we're gonna push your show. It's E-Motion. I want to remind you, it's running through June 4th at, well, um, it says tomorrow. I, I, I keep Tonight saying- Tonight and tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. At the Cherry Art Space in Ithaca, New York. Or if you can't physically get there, go watch it. It's on a live stream at thecherry.org. Thecherry.org. And there's a forward slash E-Motion. Or if you just go to thecherry.org, there'll, there'll be a link right there where you can look at that. You also want to see um, his website, it's gortzmandance.org, and there's clips from, from, from YouTube of all these other dances that you've been doing and we've been talking about over the years. So you can get a sense of what Daniel Gortzman does or, or leading up to his newest e I keep wanting to say e-commerce. I'm so sorry. It, it's That's e okay. You know what? The dance nonprofit world needs more e-commerce. So venture capitalists that are listening, you know, let's marry e-commerce to e-motion and, and make it available for free for everybody and broadcast it around the world. Um, but the last thing I'd just like to say is in addition to the GwertzmanDance.org, during the pandemic, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund helped provide leadership support for an initiative that we created a new website. It's called dancewithus.org. And I invite everybody to come to that. It's to demystify the concert dance experience, things we've been talking about in the spirit of making dance accessible and understood. There's a wealth of information there. It's a real trove of videos. It's all free. And it's dancewithus.org. Dancewithus.org. Well, I'm not gonna let you go because of course we've talked so much about dance, but we've never even gotten personal. I'm so sorry that you lost your 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 uh, papa to you. Was it COVID or just you just was something? My else? father had Parkinson's and he he lived with it with grace as long as he could, and he had tremendous support from his family and huge circle of friends. My father was a real mensch. He loved to dance. He was the boy everybody wanted as their date because he studied tap as a kid. Everybody wanted him to be their date, you know, in high school and college. He graduated with a business degree and moved to New York, got an advertising job, loved musical theater, saw Barbara Streisand in her debut performance and I Can Get It For You Wholesale on Broadway, saw Lucille Ball and Wildcat, and then like, it's a wonderful life, the Jimmy Stewart story. My grandfather was ill. My Wait, father left his job in New York City, came to Rochester to help out and met my mom and never moved, so. And your mom is okay? How's she doing? She came to see the show in Ithaca last weekend and it's, it was a real, along with some other family, so, and a lot of friends, so yeah. And, and on the personal side, are you, is there a person in your life, you dating, are you partnered? What's your, your situation, if you will? So this summer marks the 10th anniversary and my husband Stephanos Milkidis is from Greece and I have Greek family. We had a big fat Greek Jewish wedding uh, <laughs> we had in Rochester 10 years ago. There was a lot of, it was held where the International Jazz Festival is held, which used to be a Jewish community center in Rochester downtown in the 1930s, a beautiful ballroom and the company performed throughout the evening and we had a lot, we did Greek dancing, we did horror of course. And yeah, so I'm happy to share that. Well, I am horrying in my mind. <laughs> Not the way to put it, but what a joy to be here with Daniel Gortzman. Dancewithus.com or org. We remind dot you. org. Yeah, dot org. Dancewithus.org. Dance with Daniel Gortzman. Go see his show Emotion also. And I am emotional talking to you and seeing you. I thank you so much for being in the neighborhood with us. And shalom to you. Thank you so much. Shalom. Shalom. Oh my goodness, Daniel Gordsman, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, what a delight.